Lubinecki. Yes, okay. Uh, Commissioner Karen Lubinecki, and she's with us right now. Um, and welcome, and, and thank you for uh, participating in our meeting. Uh, the uh, there was a uh, a question though. Uh, she and I had chatted a little bit a couple of days ago, where I was giving her a bit of a of an orientation. Um, and the question that she raised, and I, I think I kind of at the same time, was that. Uh, she currently uh, holds a, a position with a non-governmental organization. She's the president uh, of the uh, Laurel Historical Society. Did I get the name the right? The chairman, but yes. The chairman of the, of the Laurel Historical Society. The uh, Laurel Historical Society, the, the question here is, is there any potential either actual or apparent conflict of interest if someone would be the uh, the chair of a, uh, a you know the, the senior officer of a non-governmental organization that is operational in the city that does a couple of things. One of them, um, they do get a uh, office space from the uh, the city of Laurel uh, for a lease of one dollar a year. So that's a uh, the uh, citizens and taxpayers of Laurel are are underwriting uh, the. Uh, you know, this office space, it's not being rented at a commercial rate. So there's a, uh, a deal going on between this particular organization. It's a very worthy organization, I don't mean to question it at all. Uh, but still there is that, that relationship between the city um, and the uh, Laurel Historical Society. And it's an ongoing one. It's been going on for a number of years. And I expect it's probably gonna continue on. Uh, I would well, hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but the second thing that, uh, I think raises some some additional questions is the Laurel Historical Society does solicit contributions and funds from various uh, organizations and people and businesses within the city of Laurel for their, their operating budget. Because they're a non-governmental organization, they don't get a, a government budget. Uh, they're not independently wealthy. And so they need to solicit and, and raise funds uh, every year on a regular basis. And uh, the question is, is there a real or potential or apparent conflict of interest of a uh, city of Laurel ethics commissioner uh, who wears a commissioner hat one day and wears a chairman of a non-governmental organization soliciting funds the next day uh, from these uh, corporations and businesses and some individuals and such that we, we oversee. Is there that potential conflict um, or apparent? Um, I don't know if everybody was here. Or there, there might have been, I think, a few people who may not have been on the Ethics Commission at the time. But we used to have a uh, an Ethics Commissioner by the name of Joe Fisher. I don't know if anybody knows Joe. I, I know. I I've met him, and I know his organization. Sure. Right. He's a, he's he's got an excellent excellent organization uh, where they raise funds uh, from city businesses and uh, other people uh, to uh, uh, provide funding uh, for uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, children or, or youth in, in, uh, in Laurel to be able to help them to go to college. And they also help them make application to, uh, to colleges and to get in and generally fund them. Uh, Commissioner Joe Fisher, um, when he was forming this new organization was a commissioner on the ethics commission. And he had the same question as to whether or not there's a, not necessarily an actual conflict of interest because he's a very ethical person, uh, but uh, the potential for a conflict of interest or uh, the potential for the appearance of a conflict of interest, uh, where on the one hand, he would be making decisions about uh, city officials, elected officials, appointed officials, uh, city uh, government uh, employees and such, uh, and what they do with uh, City of Laurel um, businesses and, and other uh, financial groups within the city. And uh, at the same time, then go out the next day and raise funds from them. Um, at that time, the Ethics Commission made a decision uh, in consultation with our attorney at the time that it would be best uh, for him to make uh, a choice of, of running one organization or you know his uh is one that uh supports uh disadvantaged uh laurel uh, students or being a commissioner on the laurel ethics commission and so there's a precedent of 
not the exact same thing, but I think it's relatively similar. And then there was another case where there was a, uh, this is a less on point uh, 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 precedent, but I think there's still an element of precedent in it. Um, and that is where we had a um, council member, um, uh, council member Nicholas, who at the time um, was a council member and she was also heading her own non-governmental non, non organization. I don't remember the details, but I think it had to do with um, helping uh, uh, women in Laurel uh, who might have been uh, put in bad situations. And um, so we basically, as the Ethics Commission, uh, when we spoke with her about this, you know, she, she, she came to us and talked to us. And then we spoke to her and we said, it really would be best if you made a choice between being um, you know, an elected official on the one hand uh, and then uh, soliciting funds for your, your non-governmental organization on the other. And when we were going through all these discussions and these precedents, um, it came to, uh, I think, sort of a, uh, a decision, as, as it were, uh, by the Laurel Ethics Commission at, at those times that we wanted to very much encourage uh, every citizen of Laurel to participate in non-governmental organizations and the wonderful things that they do, but that uh, there would be a line drawn between being an officer of one of these non-governmental organizations and being a regular member, and that a regular member would not have any influence over soliciting funds or coming to the city to get uh, you know, special uh, uh, rates for uh, office space and such, or an officer of, of one of these organizations would. And it was at that time that we made some edits. Um, and I would have liked them to be much more clear, but we did make some ethics, uh, uh, edits to the ethics ordinance that were approved many years ago, where we included uh, the, uh, the terms uh, non-governmental organization or not-for-profit organization uh, in the ethics ordinance uh, when we're talking about um, you know, where there is a uh, potential uh, for conflict uh, of interest in the various uh, items uh, under the prohibited activities. So that's kind of a, uh, a background that I just want to sort of lay out. And I don't know if we're going to make any decisions tonight. It's not even up to us to make any final decisions because uh, the uh, the appointments to this commission are made by the mayor and confirmed by the city council and anything that's going to be done is going to be done by them. But uh, and I think we would want to provide advice to the mayor and city council um, on where we would like to go with issues like this. And I know uh, um, Commissioner Lubinacki um, very much enjoys her work on on the uh, historic uh, uh, or the Lord Historical Society, and she very much wants to continue it, and that's wonderful. I really admire her greatly. I'm a big historian myself, and so I mean that's sort of a a wonderful thing to be doing. But it's it's the question of can a person have a foot in both uh, worlds, and, may, and especially if a person's going to be an ethics commissioner, where we would uh, want to be sure that. Uh, there's, there's not the possible tiniest trace of, of, of potential um, conflict of interest, even if it's uh, just appearance. Um, so that, I'm kind of putting that out there and I'd welcome any comments anybody would have, um, or if uh, uh, Commissioner Lubinecki would like to uh, talk just for a few minutes as well, um, you know, share some of her thoughts. Um, so would anybody like to, to say anything? I'd actually like to hear first from my fellow commissioners if sure. what their thoughts are on. Sure. Everybody speak at once. Well, the... <laughs> so Vice Please. Chair, what do you think? <laughs> you gave, um, you know, good examples of what you know what the commission has experienced in the past i i think i had just joined when uh the individual you mentioned that started the i think it's called college bound or i think it's first generation college first generation bound. college bound yeah. yes for exactly yeah it's, it's, so, it's a wonderful um, nonprofit doing wonderful things right so my 
my interest would be more or less on the appearance, but I, I would defer to see if there's any legal issue because I think if there's no real conflict that we always run into this or perceived. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. if, you know, my, I guess looking at it from a, a material standpoint, is there any type of influence uh, in the, the, you know, what, can you reiterate the connections with the city of Laurel and how there may be some influence on the relationship between the historic society? Okay, well, there's two things that the Historical Society uh, has in terms of, I mean, we always talk about, actually, we have a very good partnership with the city. I mean, it's it's longstanding. The city actually offered the Historical Society the building that is now the Laurel Museum. I don't know if you've, I know uh, the chairman hasn't visited recently, and, and I don't know if you ever have, but the city owns the building. It's the building right next to uh, the Laurel Pool. Okay, so the city owns the building. We own the collection and operate the organization. We are, the Historical Society is a 501c3. So in that sense, we have, so the city's lease with, we have a quote lease with the city, which is a dollar a month. We also, and I don't know if we discussed this, we also get, a, I, I, for want of a better word, I'll call it a stipend from the city. And they handle uh, our utilities as, as part of our lease. They handle our utilities and uh, phone, and I think they provide and computer service right now. Joanne, you'd be yeah. Um, I can tell you they have their an actual uh, budget in the Department of Parks and Recreation's facilities and grounds section. There is an entire budget um, that's dedicated to the maintenance um, and the upkeep of the Laurel Museum, since it is actually a city facility. Um, and it, it's it's typically, I think it's around 12,000 now, Theron, if I'm not- I think it's mistaken. something in that range, yeah. Yeah, and the line items may change based upon what the needs are, the maintenance needs, um, but essentially the line item, or the, excuse me, the bottom line amount remains uh, at or around the $12,000 mark every year. Right, it's kind of a standard and has yeah. been probably for 20 years at least. And therefore, it is the oversight is provided by well, and now it would be um, Director Bill Bailey. Uh, it, it falls under Parks and Recreation, so their staff do the maintenance. If contractual work needs to be done on the building, that is done through the city in the same manner that any of the Parks and Recreation uh, facilities and grounds um, is maintained. Right. So, what the Historical Society itself does is we we own the collection and we do all the exhibits and have our own staff and stuff like that. It's a little bit like, uh, like I like to say that song from the Music Man, when they left River City, the library building, but they left all the books to her, we're the books and the city owns the city owns the building. So that's that's the relationship. And it's been a very positive ongoing relationship. Uh, in my role, I mean, I am a board member and I've Done, I've been connected with the organization probably for 30, literally 30 years. Um, as chairman of the board, one of my roles is when we have events is, is to do some of the fundraising. I mean, it's to reach out and have relationships with businesses in the town. My interaction with the city officials personally is like, is minimal. I mean, because we have a ex full-time executive director. My position as chairman is I'm elected by the board. I'm not even, we have a president and elected officers, but I'm, that that's the role that I play. I don't know if that clarifies it for people at all. I mean, the person yeah, that, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. who has the most direct response with the city is probably Ann Bennett, who's our executive director. I mean, now, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Ms. Bardwell. No. I'm sorry, I pressed the mute. <laughs> um, you know, I would just think as you were talking, yeah, I think the background from you and Joanne is very helpful. I think, um, you know, I think if if this may be an option, Chairman Hester or, or not, I'm not sure. But if something arises with uh, affiliated with the Historic Society, would recusal be an option for her, it, you know, to serve in the position? But if something of that matter comes up to recuse herself from 
participating in discussions about an ethical matter because that's the point we're looking at you know how can uh, she serve on the board in her role as a ethics commission commission well, I mean, there's there is that that potential for recusal but i'm not sure that that's really going to cover uh, the concern that that i was trying to describe for example, let's say there's let's say there's an elected official or an appointed official or a city employee um, who uh, we find is uh, doing uh, some kind of business with a a business that does business with the city. Use that word too much business, but doing business with the city uh, is the uh, the key phrase from the ethics ordinance. And there is a prohibition from, for example, uh, let's say an official. Uh, going to uh, someone who is doing business with the city and asking them for funds. Um, that It's not necessarily, you know, what they're asking them, the, the money, well, there's part of it, but asking the money to do, even if it's for something that's, that's worthy, there's that perception that uh, someone is exercising uh, their um, undue influence. It's, it's under the abuse of position, although that's, that's a very harsh term. Oh, so. But but if you read through what the abuse of position uh, uh, part is, it's let's say I was um, appointed. Let, let's say just using me, I, let's say I was going to go out and start a non-governmental organization. And let's say there were ten uh, companies uh, or businesses within the city of Laurel who have contracts with the city of Laurel, or have pending contracts, or want to extend contracts, or are going to bid on contracts. And then I went to those companies and I say to them, give me money for my, my good non-governmental organization. And I could say, well, I'm just the ethics commissioner, but then could I then honestly make any kinds of decisions regarding, uh, let's say elected official X, who went to that, uh, those exact same companies and said, give me money for, for my, my worthy projects. Um, and oh, by the way, you know, yeah, you are doing business with the city and, you, and you're coming to the city looking for, for contracts and, and I'm not really gonna hold that against you. So it's, it's that, it just doesn't feel right. It's, it's the appearance of a conflict um, that I don't, I don't think recusal could really handle unless it's recusal from going to any city of Laurel businesses doing business with the city or who intend to do business with the city and not asking them for contributions. I wouldn't expect which is actually every business in the city in some way, shape, or form does business yeah. in the city because they I, get permits. That wouldn't work. Like that. That, that wouldn't work, you know, so because they are coming to the city seeking those kinds of businesses and to have a, a city official in the, the, the position of, of judging ethics from other city officials who do that exact same thing. Um, how does that, you know, how does a recusal actually work in that unless the, the commissioner recuses themselves from any kind of judgment or hearing or evaluation of, of anybody coming before us. And then how do you be a commissioner if you do that? Well, my only question would be, which crossed my mind, is that in effect, in effect, by going to, let's say I'm going to a business on Main Street, which would be a logical thing. Sure. And and they know that I'm a member of the Ethics Committee Commission. By definition, wouldn't that make them think, oh my God, I better behave more ethically? As well, opposed to, I mean, think about it. I mean, when I, I was also, as Joanne knows, I was previously a, been a member of the Historic District Commission, which there was an, there was some potential for approaching some businesses, which I specifically did not do because they would potentially come before the HDC for approvals. I mean, so well, there's, the other side of that coin is, well, if an ethics commissioner is coming to us asking for money, then it must be okay for anybody to come to us and ask money. Therefore, when council member so-and-so or mayor so-and-so or office director so-and-so or whatever comes and says, give me money, um, if an ethics commissioner can do it, then, you know, that must be okay. So I'll go ahead and, and, and expect, you know, that I, I'm, I'm expected to give them money. So there, there are two sides to that coin. I, I understand what you're saying, but there's the other side, which is the part that, that concerns me. It's the appearance of conflict. Or the well, appearance I, of I think this is a challenge and I, and I don't really have an answer for you and Joanne, yeah. this is part, is that in a city that relies on volunteers who, you know, as a non-paid person, 
who's doing this as a volunteer, sure. people who are volunteering often wear more than one hat in a community. And that's, sure. and that's just a fact of life. I mean, that's not, I'm not, I'm not unique in any way, shape or form. And I'm certainly not the best fundraiser in town, I'll tell you, but, you know, sure. but the question is, what do we want to do? That? I mean, I, I've been looking forward to serving on the commission, but yeah. my role in, even, even if I weren't chair, chairman, which is certainly possible within the next year or two, you know, we do revolve the role. I would still be a member of the board. And you'd, still be, you'd still be an officer of the, of the organization. And some, instead of just a regular, you know, plain vanilla member. Right. I'm not intending to be just a plain vanilla member for a while. So. Right, right. No, I'm not asking you to. I'm just no, no. Saying, so a, I don't know what the answer is. There's a line is. there. Right. I mean, I assume the mayor was familiar with, I mean, he knew, I mean, he knows that I'm chairman of the board of the commission and, and I mean, of the historical society and very involved in, and the relationship of the city with it. So well, you, you might not have been aware of the precedents that have been set. And, um, you know, he did not come to us at all and, and discuss anything with us in advance. It was just right. sort of a, here you go. <laughs> and which is, I mean, I'd love to have you. It's just, I have a concern and we're not going to say going to decide anything tonight. It's not even my decision. It's, it's not even this commission's decision. It's going to be the decision of the mayor and city council. Uh, but we need to advise him of and them of the, uh, I think, the pros and the cons, the, the various uh, dimensions and, and talk about precedents, talk about uh, appearances rather than actuals. I mean, nobody's suggesting that you would do an actual conflict of interest, but there's the appearance, which to the Ethics Commission, it makes makes the Ethics Commission somewhat unique in the city um, in terms of, uh, you know, needing to be especially uh, fastidious. Um, and so it's, you know, it's like I, I always encourage, uh, I'm, I try and be one of the first uh, people every year to submit my financial disclosure statement. I encourage all of our uh, commissioners to be among the first to uh, submit their financial disclosure statements just to to set a, uh, you know, um, a precedent to set a, uh, an example uh, for everyone to follow. So uh, would anybody else want to mention anything? Uh, uh, Commissioner Drake, did you have anything that you wanted to mention? What I have been thinking about as um, we've been um, discussing this is the fact that um, the historical uh, society is has a line item in the city budget and that um, the city owns the building but they are the books as as you were saying and it just seems like it's it's a weird kind of a mixture it's not all volunteer and that that the city is very much a part of it and i will say that does give me pause and it seems like there is um potential there for um the appearance of conflict okay just to clarify and i and i do hear what you're saying is that the the staff of the historical society is a paid staff paid out of the funds raised by the historical society. I mean, it's our own budget. The city's budget has nothing to do with that. The city's involvement is only for the facility's maintenance. It's not for the operation of the 501c3 at all. Di Joanne, would you? That, that is correct, that the, that the money is not budgeted for the Laurel Historical Society. The money, the, the, the money is budgeted to maintain the actual facility that is owned by the by the city but but not for the for the interior not, nothing went inside the walls um not their any of their staff not their exhibits um no money is not paid out of the city budget to support to support that effort there, there is a, 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 yeah. a, a, a an issue but, of fungibility um, if you pay for one thing but not pay for another, um, it's hard to separate those out entirely because we're the city not well, to pay thing, for the, the building or the, the upkeep of uh, the historical society would pay for that themselves out of funds that they raised. Um, 
So it's, it's only if we own the building, which we do not. Right, right. But if you didn't own the building, you would seek out some building somewhere to to rent um, in the city, hopefully, and uh, you would be able to to do that. Maybe you'd have a special fundraising effort to raise additional funds to uh, to rent commercial space in the uh, the city, uh, were the city not to do what it does. So there are there are resources from the city from the taxpayers going into the um, historical society, um, which I don't have personally. I have no problem with that at all. It's just that. It's, the the money is uh, again the the term is fungible. You can't you can't say well this dollar goes to this purpose and that dollar goes to that purpose and there's no relationship between those dollars. Well, even if you look at it that way, I I was looking at it uh, such that the the city owns the building, but the Society, historical society, does get a benefit in that it does not have to use its monies to upkeep for the upkeep of its offices, so to speak. So it is, it's not like the city is giving you money per se, but you do get a benefit from the city. I would say I, I, I can't disagree with that. Right. I, I don't know what the, okay. the, the commercial space uh, rental uh, uh, price in the city of Laurel per square foot is, but however many square feet the, the building is, um, the, the commercial going rate, I don't know what it would be, how much uh, per year, whether it's um, $1,000, uh, 500 100 I don't know what the commercial rate is, but there is that commercial rate uh, that uh, the city is, is uh, underwriting basically, and, and paying for by not renting out that space uh, as commercial space or not using it um, so that the city does not have to uh, rent out other space for its own uses. Um, and there's that plus the maintenance um, and the uh, utilities and such, whatever it is, the, the, the total amount. So whether it's an, uh, an, an in-kind uh, cash value or as opposed to actual dollars, um, there is value, um, and, and we, we use that concept, for example, in gifts. We don't, we don't say a gift is only a, a cash gift. It can be an in-kind gift. And what is the, uh, the, the commercial value of a gift if it's not cash? So how should we proceed here? Well, uh, Councillor Whitley, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I think you said it earlier, it's not the board's decision, it's the mayor and, and council's decision. Uh, right. We want to give them some written uh, recommendations or uh, something uh, based on the conversation that we've had here. That's something that we could do, but I don't think the board has, you know, final say. Um, no, we don't. We don't. So it's just, you know. Um, Would you like to take a, a crack at uh, writing a, like a one page summary of, of what the issues are? And asking them to, uh, um, you know, consider these um, and decide uh, how they would like to proceed. Okay, uh, I can do that. Um, if could uh, ask if you, if just if you and the, and 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 the new uh, board member could just send me, you know, a couple of bullet points as to sure. what your positions are, and then I can take and go through the ordinance and and, and try to present them both to the the, uh, the mayor and city council for their consideration. Well, I sent an email around, uh, you were included on it uh, a little bit earlier today. Okay. Um, I, th I think where I laid out most of these points, I might, you know, let me add one or two maybe. And, and maybe you could copy me on that? Mr. Um, yeah, sure. I, I have no problem. I mean, this is, as I say, we're not making any decisions. It's not up to us. We just want to yeah. make sure that the uh, the Ethics Commission is, um, you know, held to the highest standards and uh, ask that the uh, City Council and Mayor uh, consider all of its options uh, when they decide how they want to proceed. Right. Um, I'm going to be out of town for a week starting tomorrow morning, so you won't be hearing from me for a week on this, just because I'm going to I, literally I leave tomorrow morning. So. That's okay. fine. Okay. Just so you know, I'm not being unresponsive. I'm just out of town. Well, That's if there are any, if there any points or bullets you would like to uh, submit to uh, Councillor Whitley uh, this evening? you know, by email later this evening or something, that would be great. Well, that'll depend. I have some things to do before we leave her. Okay. Now, and that invitation is open to any of the board members on the call as well. Good. Okay. Well, I think uh, 
uh, we, we're not going to be able to go further than this. Um, this again, it's just a discussion, and and we'll move on to the uh, um, next item. Uh, well, before we move on to the next item, let me just you know put it in the minutes. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Kenneth Dumbs for a great number of years of service to the uh, the Ethics Commission. Uh, uh, he recently stepped down, and uh, I was trying to. Uh, find exactly when he joined, but it was a very, very long time ago. So he's been with us for a great many years. So as a uh, chairperson, I wanted to uh, basically say thank you, uh, Commissioner Kenneth Doms, for all of your years of service to the, uh, the Ethics Commission in the city. Um, next item is uh, number six, uh, approval of the minutes. Um, are there any comments? Uh, a request for edits uh, for the minutes for the last meeting. Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So move. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second, though I wasn't present for them. Can I say? I think. Can I second for even though I wasn't? Well, yeah. um, I mean, let me just make sure. Have you been formally sworn in? I think we we remember we had that discussion of whether no, that I was necessary. I just want just wanted I, to have it on the uh, the record here. So I, I spoke with the mayor's office and they said that as soon as you were confirmed by the uh, the city council that you were an official member. Okay, okay. That this is different from what we've done in the past, where people have had to be been actually sworn in and raised their hand and taken oath of office. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's the way it's done yeah. now, that, that's fine. Um, okay. Uh, well, then I'll okay. second the motion. Excellent. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting a pass or uh, motion passes uh, unanimously. Um, moving on to the general public hearing. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to address the Laurel Ethics Commission? Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to the uh, next item. Um, update from uh, myself, the chairman, and staff on the amended rural ethics ordinance. Um, as you all know, the, uh, the state of Maryland uh, sent us a, a letter last year, at the end of last year, saying uh, that they were requiring every jurisdiction in the state of Maryland to update uh, their ethics ordinances, uh, to add and, and modify their ethics ordinances, they provided us with some uh, templates to, to go by. Uh, we worked on that, uh, we did that. Uh, we came up with uh, modifications uh, to recommend to the mayor and city council. We submitted those to the, uh, the state ethics commission who reviewed them and said, yes, those are uh, meeting our requirements. Uh, at the uh, meeting of the mayor and city council last Monday, uh, after having previously uh, read in and, and discussed it a few weeks before, uh, at the, uh, the meeting of the mayor and city council uh, last Monday, they did uh, approve the modifications uh, as presented, as recommended uh, uh, in their entirety. So we now have uh, newly modified uh, sections of our ethics ordinance. And what I'd like to do uh, as our next step, now that we have those, um, since they were approved in the form of a uh, of a motion, a city council motion, uh, they were not done in a red line of the entire ordinance. They were done as a uh, clause here and a clause there uh, request uh, for, the, for the mayor and city council to, to approve. So I think what we need to do now is integrate those uh, into uh, the, uh, the previous ethics ordinance so that we can come up with a newly revised, uh, fully uh, updated, uh, everything all in one place ethics ordinance and get that up on the, uh, the city website to replace the, uh, the current one, which is what we had prior to these, uh, these amendments. Um, I guess the question is, how do we go about uh, doing that integration? Is this something we want to ask council to do for us? Is the, is the city prepared to do this? In some way, uh, how does the city normally do this? Uh, does the city ask the city solicitor to uh, to integrate uh, uh, the city council um, um, uh, decisions into uh, existing city ordinances? Uh, what's what's the normal way this is done? Uh, 
I believe it's done, as you said, sometimes through our uh, our legal counsel. Um, but the the best advice would be to go through Sarah Green, our clerk to the council, because ultimately she is then responsible for uploading any of that information into the municipal code that does go online. Um, so I think deferring to her would probably be the best in order to get a clear answer. Okay. Um, is that something we could ask you to uh, uh, go and uh, talk to her about? And yes. Get us eventually a timeline for when that can happen. Uh, in the interim, assuming that's not going to happen instantly, things don't normally happen instantly. It'd be nice if they did, but uh, perhaps we might ask uh, for the city to load uh, the uh, uh, the new uh, revisions onto the uh, the ethics ordinance or uh, underneath the ethics ordinance on the ethics website so that the, the public has access to them. And then once we have a unified uh, uh, code, then we can replace those two with with the one unified code. Does that make sense? And because I'd, I'd want citizens to have uh, immediate access to uh, to the changes that the mayor and city council have approved. That's fine. I'll talk to Sarah tomorrow about that. Okay. So that's a, that's a, a two-step process. Excellent. Any other uh, suggestions about how we do that? Everybody happy with it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Next item, which is uh, substances, financial disclosure statements, one of our favorite uh, issues. It's a recurring one that we talk about every year. Um, and this year is no different in having challenges uh, with some individuals. Uh, so if we could uh, perhaps ask staff to uh, just take a minute to give us uh, a brief overview on the, uh, the latest status of the 2022 financial disclosure statements. Uh, how many are still outstanding? Uh, how are the uh, fines being, uh, are they being paid? Are there are people sort of holding back? Or, or what's the overall status? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, the report that I sent around with, with the invite to tonight's meeting did have the updated as of this morning. And uh, we still have, let's see, one, two. Number six. Three, four, five. Yeah, we still have six people who have not submitted. Um, and the uh, and the current fines right now, as of today, would not be ninety four dollars. It'd be no, it's it's one hundred and two now. Or one hundred and four if you include today. Yeah, one hundred and four if you include today. Yes. Right. So where it says current fine ninety four, that that should be one hundred and four. Right. Okay. And how about the people who have um, now submitted theirs, but been advised that there is a, uh, by, by the mayor, that there is a $2 a day fine for, for them and, and the varying amounts, depending on how late they were. But how are those fines being, being uh, seen? Are they coming in? Are they being received? Or are they? Uh... Uh, so far, we have uh, only received one fine in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, going to uh, talk to Anna in the mayor's office about um, sending out another letter um, to the people who who have submitted their forms, letting them know exactly what they owe and uh, if she wants and how to pay it yeah. and how to pay it. Yes. And um, and a second letter uh, to those people who still have not submitted. Right. Right. And copies of those still have not submitted to go to whoever is their uh, uh, superior. Uh, if they're, say, for example, on a commission to go to the, uh, the chairman of the, the board or the commission or to go to the uh, yeah. president of the city council, if they have to be a council member or such. Mm -hmm. Yes, they they um, those letters always go to the um, the head of their commission or the president of the council, uh, depending on who it is. And with a recommendation that uh, those heads of those organizations or organizational units request the person to uh, recuse themselves from any, uh, any actions until they get their uh, ethics uh, situation uh, settled? Yes. 
Okay. Yes. And uh, one thing that, well, let's see. Um, aside from just the submission issues, um, both uh, Councilman or Council President Smith and Council Member uh, DeWalt came in and they finished their forms. So they have been, been completed. And um, if you see the note next to Timothy Miller, um, he did get back to me. I, I asked him when um, he, KCI would finish paying out for those uh, shares. And he hasn't gotten back to me on that yet. Maybe a reminder could go out to him. Yes, I, I emailed him this morning. So um, if I haven't heard from him, I will, um, in short order, I will get back to him. Okay. And again, with a, a copy to uh, the um, DPW director and, and city engineer. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I had a question that I, and I just wondered at, because I was looking at, uh, specifically, you have Mr. Clacoon, who has not submitted and has a current fine. What is the process? Mr. Clacoon, I know as of January, was no longer a member of the commission. So what is their mechanism? Well, he would be expected to, to pay fines up until the day that he was no longer um, a member of the commission. It's the same as if someone, um, say, for example, let's say I retired today. Um, I would still need to do a financial disclosure statement for 2023, even though I would not be in my position in 2024 when, when the financial disclosure statements are done. I would be required to uh, go up to the time that I was still in my position. And the same with, with fines. Um, I guess it would depend on when he actually resigned his, his position. Uh, early January, I believe. But my, my question is really, what is the incentive... <laughs> To pay and what happens if he doesn't? I, well, that's, that's it's always general, the issue. I just don't understand. I just don't know what the process is. So. Well, that's always the issue. Generally, uh, we do have uh, a certain number of things that we can do in terms of consequences if people violate the ethics ordinance. Um, most of them are not um, all that severe. Um, uh, we can issue a letter of rep reprimand or we can ask their. Uh, supervisor, whoever they may be, uh, to take appropriate action. We can ask the mayor and city administrator to look into what they feel is an appropriate action that they can take as city officers and officials. If it's something that's that's really severe, though, um, we, we do have the authority uh, to raise it to the, uh, the circuit court of Prince George's County, and we would ask our uh, council uh, Council Whitley to to take the the matter to the uh, to that level, that would have to be a pretty severe kind of a situation. It's not. I'm, I'm just looking like Mr. Cocoon resigned. I think he resigned in January, if I remember correctly. And well, if he so resigned not, in January, then then he would have to still do a 2022. I understand, yeah. but in terms of the of a fine, he, there's nobody to say you can't serve on the commission anymore. I mean, you can't vote, you can't, and he's a pro, and he's a private volunteer, so he's not a paid city officials. So I just well, wondered what, what. Well, he would not be, well, I mean, well, I don't started, want to, we don't started, need to spend a lot of time the doing this. Would, the commission would need to make the decision, but, you know, perhaps, you know, one, one suggestion I might start with might be to consider um, saying that he is no longer welcome to serve on any city of Laurel uh, appointments of any kind until such time as he pays his, his fines. Um, I mean, I don't know that we can actually you know, send a police officer to his house and well, give us the cash. I don't think that we're really, really, really able to do that. Um, Chairman, I do believe though that there are um, in the, um, it, it hinders your ability to run for office if you have an outstanding debt with the city. Oh, clearly. Yeah, um, clearly. So there may be other provisions. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure that if it's if it's no, counted as debt, it's counted as debt to the city, which would need to be paid off before doing um, other kinds of business with the I'm city. Just curious, I just didn't I didn't know what the process was. Yeah, yeah. well, on the ethics ordinance, if you want a special trash collection, 
Uh, you don't typically get to schedule those types of things as well if you have outstanding debts. So. Uh, okay. there, there are things that can be done. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not an iron fist, and <laughs> but it's, uh, it can be something that, that has some um, a push behind it. Um, it's just not a, a violent kind of push. But definitely, we would want to, you know, take actions uh, to uh, do what we can if he doesn't pay. Yeah, I was just curious. That's all. Yeah, yeah. But he was covered by the ethics ordinance, so he's required to submit the uh, the financial disclosure statement for the time in which he was covered, which was an entire year, or maybe not the entire. Well, yeah, no, it's the entire year, 2022. Any other questions or discussions? Uh, yes, um, uh, Laura, the new ones that have come in, um, they still need to be reviewed, correct? Yes, right. they do. Okay. And, in and fact, the, the one ones that... that have... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know one, no, the one someone... that I got this morning, it was all, he filled it out with N.A. So I need to get back to him about that. And uh, yeah, but I'm saying the ones that um, had not been uh, received, mm -hmm. um, uh, but had since come in. So those need to be reviewed. And I think you said there have been an um, amendment to, um, I think two of them. Yes. Um, Councilman Walt and someone else, and so that also needs to be reviewed just to make sure that it's the um, amendment is what we were asking. Yes. Okay. okay. So, to, if if you want to, um, if you and Commissioner Bardwell want to email me and let me know when when you'd like to come in and do that, I'll make sure and have them pulled out. So they um, that they'll be ready to go for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Commissioner Drake. Uh, I was going to mention that, but uh, I had skipped over it. I should have. <laughs> but that's 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 critical. We need to have that done. So thank you both for doing that. Continuing on in your subcommittee okay. role of FDF financial disclosure statement review. Yeah. All righty. Um, the item B under this um, is request the subcommittee and other commissioners uh, to make any recommendations for specific edits to the financial disclosure statements for the 2023 uh, forms. We don't need to do this tonight, uh, but just basically put it out there that uh, we're going to need to, uh, you know, start this up again uh, for uh, for next year. And uh, we have some more experience, another year of experience, and uh, if everybody could you know, find some time in the coming weeks and months to take a look at the, uh, um, you know, what we sent out uh, for the 2022 cycle and make any suggestions for any edits. Um, one of them that uh, uh, Commissioner Lubinecki made uh, when we had a, a brief to, you know, orientation discussion was to be perhaps a little clearer on due dates. And uh, perhaps we might, um, you know, on the forms that we do send out, put the due dates in bigger sized um, fonts and maybe highlight them with, with a yellow or something to make it really, really hard for somebody to say, oops, I didn't bother reading the instructions, therefore I don't didn't know that the, the due date was the uh, the end of April. And just from a, and I would add to that, the, the consequences of not, the, the fact that there's an actual fine involved, I think right. it's not quite, Clear. I mean, it mentions that the potential of fines, but that there is an actual fine that will be what now five dollars a day. Right. So I'd be happy to mention a fine of five dollars a day. Now, um, I'm not suggesting that we retroactively do five dollars no, a day no, no, from 2022, which we're working on now. You know, because that was done under the the previous ordinance. But for the upcoming one, uh, I, th I would be happy to mention five dollars a day, five hundred dollars total. Um, for anybody who who comes in late, um, so I think that would be fine too, and, and do that in, in slightly bolder text, maybe uh, highlighted by yellow, like we've highlighted a couple of the other 
key issues in the, uh, the instructions. But I mean, I would welcome anybody uh, sort of taking a hand at uh, uh, doing a, you know, some edits and anything that, that you can suggest would make it a little bit better for this next round and a little smoother for this next round. Uh, just want to kind of put that out there as something uh, we can all work on in, in the coming weeks and months. And I think I think we also need to state something even it seems obvious to us because we look at them all the time that it's for the year of 2022. So you, if you were on this commission in 2022, you have to fill it out. But a mm -hmm. lot of people that get confused about that. So I think maybe we need to state if you were on a commission, I know this came out in, in 2023, but if you were on a board or commission in 2022, you do need to fill it out, even if you are no longer on the same border commission and fines will still be applicable right, right right i mean i hate to say that but you know i mean laura and i had this long discussion which is why i got mine in on time <laughs> <laughs> but yes and i have a, i have a question joanne this is maybe a question you can ask in in today's technology has there been any thought to being able to do some of these forms like in a filled in pdf form even if you have to have a direct signature that would make it a little easier to get it submitted or something? Uh, I'm gonna defer to the commission because I believe this is something that you all have have discussed ah, previously, okay. correct? Yeah, we, we have discussed it. And in the past, uh, our uh, discussion led us to the, uh, the point where we wanted something that's an actual document, a legal document with a real signature on it uh, to ensure that there's no possible question um, that everything on there is being submitted by that individual. Um, I don't know what the technology is these days with regard for, for legal documents. Um, are all legal documents in the state of Maryland now virtual and, and with electronic signatures? Um, if so, I, I don't wanna go against the flow, but uh, it's just awfully, uh, I think, uh, comforting for everybody to know that there is a uh, an actual document as opposed to a, uh, a packet of electrons. I, I was thinking more in terms of the, the form being there, you know, you can fill in PDF forms, and even if you have to print it out and then sign it and send it in, that would just make it a little bit easier for people who are doing it. That that's where I was kind of going. I understand that. We that we did we did try to do that, um, and the glitch was getting IT to set up the PDF for us. Ah, they just did not get around to it. Okay. So um, so we'll try that again. Right. Okay, well, I'd, I'd be happy with that. Just uh, just speaking for myself as one commissioner, and but still having the uh, the uh, legal requirement for uh, uh, ink pen signatures and uh, um, you know, for the ones uh, you know from the elected officials to also have those uh, you know the, the more extensive ones to also have those uh, uh, with the actual uh, stamp of the uh, uh, they call it the uh, the notary public. Yeah, I don't know if that's um, that has been is something that you can do on the computer is have it virtually stamped by a notary public. I have no idea. I'm that's. I've done a lot of legal document signing over the past uh, six months uh, as the administrator of my brother's estate. He passed away end of last year. And in every case, they don't accept, uh, at least it's the state of Florida where he passed away, they don't accept a, an electronic uh, notary. I can't say that I've seen an electronic notary in all my dealings just yet. You know, I, they've gotten to every just about everything else, but I have not seen that one yet. <laughs> So. Yeah, I'm accustomed to e-signatures, not notaries. <laughs> yeah, we have to look at, you know, convenience, fillable forms. I, I'm a proponent for if if IT ever gets to that point, as well as e-signatures that has their handwritten um, signature, like on DocuSign, to try to make it more convenient for these filers. And 
you know, we're not, you know, that's my opinion and I'll, you know, stand firm on trying to make these, the process more um, convenient. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely revisit that with the IT department. Um, but I believe the, the issue with the um, notary is the embossed stamp that's required. Not sure mm -hmm. how they get around that. Yep. Okay, well, I'll just say I'm I'm not a uh, a person who will only go by what the way it was done back in the, the good old days with uh, <laughs> with quill pens, but uh, I'm also not ready to, uh, to to leap too far into the electronic future where um, it becomes a little less uh, certain, and someone can say, "Well, that's just that wasn't me. You know, somebody hacked my uh, my account." Uh, an actual ink signature is uh, something you can't say somebody hacked my account. You'd be right. surprised. <laughs> well, yeah, somebody <laughs> forged my signature. But it's it's harder to do. <laughs> um, okay, so if anybody, everybody could take a look at these things. Um, and I appreciate uh, whatever you come up with. Uh, one other yeah, point. I'm not sure. Go ahead. I'm not sure. I, I may have missed. I had to step away for a second. Did Tony? Did you mention about the? Well, Commissioner Drake, did you mention about the consistency between the um, commissioner commission members that appear on the form letterhead itself being consistent with who's actually serving in those roles? Oh no, I had not. Okay, so we brought it to um, Laura's attention that the the out the forms um, had outdated or they weren't updated to reflect the current commissioners on the ethics commission, and we just want to make sure that that we're consistent with that going forward. Definitely, definitely. And I I did update. Um, if you look on the agenda, that's the updated. Um, letterhead and that, that right should... but but it would be re updated again because of whoever you know once we get this straight as far as yes Lubinecki and mm -hmm. wh whomever okay thanks yeah. thank you for so, doing that and, yeah and right I, I, and a quick question on the letterhead um uh counselor uh um Whitley did you want to have uh ESQ after your name yeah I meant to ask you about that yes please Okay. It would be it would be helpful, and then do we want to be uh, consistent with uh, Commissioner Drake, uh, who has the full word? Do we want to just have it either be Esquire entirely or ESQ? Uh, ESQ is fine. Uh, Commissioner Drake, do you have a strong preference? No, that's fine. Okay, let's let's do ESQ period after both of those uh, names. Okay. And then, um, Commissioner Lubinecki, uh, did you have any honorifics with your name that you want up there? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. okay. All right, then. Uh, we're good there. Is there any other business uh, any other commissioners uh, would like to raise uh, at this time? Hearing none, is there any business any of the staff would like to raise at this time? Um, I, actually, I, I just wanted to say um, I, I'm kind of looking at setting a, a deadline for myself to do a draft of the 2023 uh, financial disclosure statements okay. and try and um, so if if you do have recommendations about changes, um, Keep me in the loop and I will make some changes and then send it out and we can just start working from there. But I'm kind of looking at September for getting a first draft on that. Very good. Well, you have a couple of suggestions already in terms of mm -hmm. uh, making bold and, and larger about the uh, the date and the fines and mentioning mm -hmm. the fines are five dollars and, and five hundred. So there's there's one point to start at, but yeah, if yeah. anybody could, could provide any other advice based on experience from this past year, that would be wonderful. Okay. 
Um, I have a quick question, uh, Attorney Whitley. I'm trying to remember. Was there a sample um, financial disclosure form that was sent out by the state? Do you remember? I do not recall. Um, I can go back through my okay. and see, but I don't recall. I I had talked okay. to them a couple of years ago, and uh, they actually um, their form is much more in depth than ours. Um, I think everybody that they have fill it out from the state, they basically fill out the long form. And um, so they don't have any any simple simplified form. Anyway, they didn't a couple of years ago. I can check back with them and see what they have to say. Was there anything yeah, I'd like the... to know since they just re they just redid <laughs> the ordinance. I'm wondering if they may have put out um, the samples. Okay, I'll I'll uh, email them. They're very helpful there. Well, there, okay. there might be one, one or two you. edits. That are, there may be one or two edits needed based on the uh, the revisions that have just been approved. Mm -hmm. um, I'm nothing really, you know, jumped out at me, but I would imagine there might be something in there uh, uh, it, that, that might be revised in the, uh, especially the long form, um, to make sure we're we're uh, in, in full compliance with what's what it says in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more thing. Um, Laura, on the the form that shows the financial disclosure uh, review subcommittee report, I would just say from a consistency standpoint, we we want to make sure that when some submitted versus submit is captured. Oh. I see submitted on some and submit for others. So okay. I, okay, I'm taking submit to mean submitted. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't consistent there, so. Okay, thank you. And maybe that last column, we might uh, expand slightly to say fine paid or something once we receive a fine. Okay. That's a good idea. And just indicate the amount that was received. Mm-hmm. Fine paid twenty five dollars, whatever the amount is. Okay. Any other thoughts? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Meeting aye. stands. Well, it's unanimous. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for for coming to the Zoom, and uh, look forward to uh, getting everything uh, from everyone in, in the future in terms of getting materials to our uh, counselor and and others uh, and staff and so on. All right. If you can send me that memo that you had sent around, on, so I'll have it when I come back and I can respond. And and I want to see what you were talking about in case there's something I want to clarify from that before I do any additional stuff on that and I'll be back on the back in town on the 28th. I'll forward that to you this evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.